Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Cup Interviews, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your host for this episode, Ryan Barakovich, and I am joined today by somebody who has written and is directing their own original musical that is soon to be opening at Hart House Theater. It's called The Grey, a wild musical and concert, and note the E at the end of wild because it is based <laughs> on the classic novel The Picture of Dorian Gray by none other than Oscar Wilde. Anthony Palermo, thank you for joining me today. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. So happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. I'm excited to talk about this show that you've written and are now directing. But before we get into it, I have to ask our favorite introductory question. What is in your cup today? Well, in my cup today is actually, it's an iced Americano, mm -hmm. as one does. And it's in this little mug that says, I don't give a sip. I don't know if oh, you can read it. Yes. But I, yeah, I, I thought it was fun. I thought it was silly. So it's fun. I had it's to go for it. It's a silly, sassy mug. Very appropriate. Silly, sassy mug. <laughs> Gotta have it. Gotta have Love one. It. You know, it's funny. I was trying to decide what mug I should use for this mm -hmm. particular recording, because when I can, I try to make my choice on theme. And I was torn right. between two. So in the spirit of wildy and excess, I've decided to mm -hmm. have both. One of them is just my University of Toronto mug, because your show yeah. is happening at Hard House on University yeah. of Toronto campus, where I'm drinking coffee. But the other one that I couldn't resist not including as well is also a musical based on a 19th century novel. It is Les Mis. And Les Mis. I just have water in that one, because two mugs of coffee felt, coffee just felt a little too excessive. Yeah, yeah. But hey, that's the way that's the way Oscar would have wanted it. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I, before we get into the musical itself, why don't you just tell us a little about yourself for the benefit of anyone who's tuning into this, who's like, who who is this exactly? Maybe Ooh, some of how you first got into theater, some of your relevant training, influences, experiences, projects. The floor is yours to describe yourself as you please. Yeah, for sure. So I am actually graduating this year. I'm in my final year of theater school at the University of Toronto, Mississauga and Sheridan's Joint Program for Theater and Drama Studies, um, where I spent the last four years training, um, getting like a really grounded kind of view both of the academic side of theater and also of like the practical nature of it, which has been great. And through that, I've had a lot of opportunities to direct and write my own work. So it's been a great place for me to start making some things happen for myself, I guess. In terms of some things I've worked on, I've been writing musical theater for six years at this point. I wrote my first musical uh, in grade 11 for the National Theater School competition, which actually happened at Hart House, which is so crazy that my first musical actually happened at Hart House, and here we are six years later. Full circle. Uh, full circle. So kind of a beautiful homecoming. But I wrote a couple in high school. I had the chance to develop another one called Mythic Women and their Cabaret to Save Humanity last year at UTM where I am the executive producer of the English and Drama Student Society as well. Uh, and I got to direct that, but that was written with my friend Chloe Castrucci. Uh, and I also developed a piece of mine uh, at Soul Pepper's Queer Youth Cabaret last year. It was a one person song cycle, theatrical in nature. It was called She Men and the Giant Fucking Snake um, that I wrote and performed. Uh, and that was a fun one. Um, and I also recently, Musical Stage Company asked me to be a writer and composer for One Song Glory this year. So I got to work on that, which was super exciting and have my work be developed there. Wow. So such a robust career already blossomed <laughs> and you're not even finished theater school yet. How is this possible? <laughs> Speaking of theater school, uh, as some of our listeners know, I'm a TA in the program at UTM that, you know, that's my day job. The cup doesn't pay the bills. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like, I, and I... Yeah, just in like the intro theater history classes, and I only started teaching there last year, so wouldn't have had you as a student in those first year courses, but yeah. I saw you in Tartuffe this year oh, when really? you played Oregon. And yeah, yeah. I did miss, because you were also in Alcestis this season, right? Yeah. I had COVID that week and unfortunately did not get no. to see that one, but you were excellent in Tartuffe. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. I've actually, I feel like I've shouted out that production of Tartuffe <laughs> on this very show a couple of times. No we, we didn't review it, but I... It's funny, the week that I saw it, we did a review of the play Martyr that was happening at Native Earth yeah, yeah. Performing Arts. And I compared that play to the, as if it was the anti-Tartuffe, because it seemed like it was a thematic inversion, just because Tartuffe was so fresh in my head. I'm like, oh, hey, this is the thing I want to say in this review. 
And, and then <laughs> shortly after that, we we reviewed Prodigal at Crow's Theater uh, in collaboration with The Howlin' Company, which was written and directed by Paolo Santalucia, Paolo. who directed yeah. you in that production of Tartuffe. And I yeah. noticed a plot similarity between <laughs> stuff that might have been in his mind working on Tartuffe at the same time as this show. So, you know, it's just yeah. funny how that keeps coming back. And now here I am interviewing you. You know, revival of Tartuffe, really. It was actually, like, quite honestly, it was my favorite thing I definitely did in theater school. It was such a blast. It was such a, like, a fun show to do. It was, it was really a great time. Yeah, it's a good one, for sure. <laughs> okay, but we're not here to talk about Tartuffe. We are here to talk about The Grey, a wild new musical in concert, mm -hmm. which you have recently written. You composed the music and wrote the lyrics, correct? And, yes. and you are now directing it for Hard House Theater, which at time of recording, well, it's coming out a bit, little under a week, but at time of release, assuming this episode comes out when it's supposed to, it's coming out tomorrow on the 20th, or it opens at least. Uh, so let's, for anyone who's maybe tuning into this, like, oh, maybe I should see that show. Let's hear your elevator pitch. How would you describe it to somebody who you think might be interested? Yeah, so The Grey is an adaptation inspired by the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde set in Toronto's gay village in the 1970s at a real life club that existed called Club David's, David's Disco, and kind of based on the real events that transpired during that period in the 70s in that club and the social and political background of the village at that time, um, melded with the character dynamics and narrative, in essence, of the picture of Dorian Gray. That's kind of my elevator pitch for it. It's a wonderful elevator pitch. It <laughs> checks every box. It's perfect. Uh, so where did the idea for this play come from? And how was it developed from just initial idea into the piece that we have today? Yeah. Um, I actually started working on this or kind of conceptualizing this idea for what this would be. I mean, like, I knew that I think I originally started really wanting to write about this period of the 1970s in the village. I became really fascinated fascinated with it in my early university days about like four years ago because of the cbc podcast the village season one specifically talks about this where they kind of talk about bruce MacArthur and those murders and kind of and he tries to justin ling who records it and is the journalist behind it uh tries to track that back to the 70s with the disappearance of these people these gay men from the village and the inaction by police and I really became fascinated with that whole system and why that was occurring, why it was allowed to happen, and what kind of like the culture and social dynamic of that space was at that time. So this piece kind of went through a couple of different versions of what it could be. And then I actually took a queer writing class <laughs> at U of T, and I read the picture of Dorian Gray. And for some reason, these two ideas just linked in my head. And I am one for adaptation. I really love uh, creating theater based off of real life events. And I also love adapting older work so it was kind of like the amalgamation and also writing musical theater so it was kind of an amalgamation of all these things that formed together in a very strange and beautiful way and i started to kind of conceptualize what this could be and what this narrative could look like and what themes i could kind of link together to discuss queerness and discuss you know this environment at the time but also how that relates to now all together through developing it as an audio drama so Initially, I wrote this as a four-part series that's currently on Spotify. It's called The Great A Wild Audio Drama. And it also is musical in nature, but not, not like a traditional musical, just has music in it kind of thing. And that was developed by, or produced by Victoria College Drama Society last March is when it came out. But I started writing it the summer before. So it, this piece has been through many, many phases. And then I was asked by Heart House to develop it for the stage, which I was always initially my plan, but... I was given this platform and I was so, so grateful to be doing that and to have that opportunity to do it so soon. Um, so then I kind of went into, right into the next draft of adapting it for the stage, um, which kind of involved like four hours of content, amalgamated down, amalgamated back out, and just all that comes with trying to figure out how that works. And it's been a journey, but it's been so amazing. Yeah, I can't believe Hard House wouldn't give you a four hour canvas to just do the entire thing. That's <laughs> Why crazy. not? I know. Inconceivable. Two part um, epic. Why not? Yeah. And I believe I read this somewhere that the audio version or that you had previously done or workshop won multiple University of Toronto Drama Coalition Awards. I don't know if you yes. deliberately didn't mention that because you didn't <laughs> want to be a braggart, but here yeah, you'd be a braggart, it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah, it won, it, it won a lot with the cast. Our Dorian won Best Lead in a Project. I won Best Direction for it. It won Best Virtual Show, I believe, because it was a virtual production at the time. I won Best, I think, Musical Achievement for it. So it won kind of a couple things and people were 
definitely had some hype about it. So it's good. It's a lot of good press to have coming to this production that you swept <laughs> yeah, exactly. an award ceremony. <laughs> and how much of that cast is back, or is it completely new this time? Yeah, so we have two people returning of the main of our main four. Um, sadly, our original Dorian is in drama school in England now. We Shucks. couldn't fly them back. So sad, but it's been great to have it's been both great to have those those old voices in the space to develop these characters because we've been working on this piece for like a year at this point more than a year it's quite insane to to kind of be working that long on a specific character and a new work with these original cast members because a lot of it was developed based on them i was still writing the series almost like while we casted so i was like still writing the episodes for these people almost as it was coming out and going into it this time, knowing who was going to be playing these roles also kind of influenced that. But at the same time, it's been great to have new voices in the work and figure out how it lives beyond the span of just like a cast that's like frozen in time, how we can develop and what other iterations of this piece could be. Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah, it's always nice to have returning people, but it's nice to shake it up a bit, have new people. Yeah. I'm sure your original Dorian hanging out on that side of the pond, <laughs> kissing Oscar Wilde's grave. <laughs> Hopefully they'll be here in spirit, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, no, it's definitely great. I guess I just want to dig into the musical element of this a little bit because, yeah. you, you know, you've already sort of addressed, you know, how you came to the novel, how you came to this queer history that's you've brought together into this piece, but how did what did you feel about the material really lent itself to being a musical especially if that wasn't so ingrained in the original audio version yeah i mean i think it was always ingrained in the original audio version it just almost was like more so expanded for because this is a musical on stage um kind of like the song to not song ratio has expanded i guess um but the songs that i wrote for it were pretty foundational to the to the piece in its in its first existence um there was something about this being set in a club to me and what David's actually was as a club that kind of lent itself to being a musical, almost in like a diegetic way, which is how it first kind of came up as music. And for, you know, a musical, you can't, I mean, in this, in this version, it's not just diegetic music, but how to be like, it kind of starting from that base. Uh, I thought it kind of just already lent itself to it. And I also was really inspired by the genre of glam rock and what that meant, like David Bowie, Elton John, these kind of figures who, Whose music, was, whose music was so theatrical in essence and told such a story without being musical theater, kind of like adjacent to a lot of the pop musicals that are existing now, but in, in a different kind of way. So yeah, those things kind of lent themselves together to me and I was really interested in exploring how this story could be told through music. I just, I guess as myself as an artist, uh, that's kind of where my lens is always at. How do I tell the story through music? I call it musical storytelling is what I do, not really musical theater. And the songs don't necessarily fit into a musical theater category all the time, but they do fit into some sort of uh, uh, explaining some sort of emotional core or getting to the root of the emotions of the narrative of the characters through using music. Mm -hmm. no, that's great. Do you want to talk about maybe some of the songs in particular? Do you have a favorite song from it that you'd like to really give a special shout out to here? Yeah, let me think about that one. If it's like um, choosing I, of your favorite children, you can have a couple. I'm not being particular here. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because it's really funny because I did original. I think originally in the series there was eight original songs, and we've expanded outward to more. So it's funny to hear how these original songs contrast or kind of like blend into these this new stuff that I wrote a year later, and how those oppose each other. It's very interesting. I do love uh, a song called starborn which is the first song in the first episode or one of the songs in the first episode but it kind of acts as our i want song in the musical see it fits um, traditional musical theater categories. yeah 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 what are you it about? always it can always fit it. it's just i would say oh i always it's definitely a subversion from what traditional musical theater writers who are like this is your song needs to do this <laughs> it's definitely not that and i think i wanted it to be like that i don't think i wanted it to be a musical theater musical i wanted it to almost feel like a play with music that divulges into musical theater sometimes but I didn't want to define it as that. I think there's almost like a stigma around musical theater that I don't want to associate with the show. I think it's beyond that and it's more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Now, I guess on the subject of music, this is being presented at Hard House in the form of a musical and concert. Mm -hmm. uh, was that your first choice or is that just kind of what the logistical constraints of performing it on this time scale at this venue meant for you and do you see it ever being developed into a full-scale musical with the big shebang of a production 
Yeah, I was asked to do it as a concert in, in, in this form. It also has been a great opportunity because I have not had the kind of, because there's not been an expectation to have this be a full production. I've had the opportunity to spend the rehearsal process really honing in on the material itself and almost using it as a workshop, which has been incredible. Like I would say genuinely pretty invaluable to the piece and its development going forward. I feel like if I didn't have this period and I felt forced to go right into production and not have that amount of time, the piece won't be, wouldn't be as strong or as I would feel that it is as compelling and as worked as I wish it was. So I'm glad that this is the piece in its, in its presentation as it is right now. I would love to have it fully produced. And as a heart house kind of told me when they wanted it, they were like, this is the first, we want this to be the starting place for it to go on. We don't, this is not the ending. This is the beginning and we want to give you that platform. So it's been, I'm excited to see where it goes and to bring it places now that I have like a fully fleshed out score for it, a fully fleshed out script of two hours, like where it can go. Wow. That's beautiful. So nice to have that support. And yeah. you know, they clearly have faith in it. If that doesn't tell people that they should really come see this, <laughs> if the loads of accolades it's already received hasn't already done it, uh, I don't know what's going to convince people at this point. <laughs> so how have rehearsals been going at the time of recording? You're still just a little under a week out from opening. How's it been? <laughs> They've been good. <laughs> They've been exciting. The cast is doing such beautiful, incredible work in bringing themselves to this piece in a way that I couldn't have even dreamed of. And just has a lot of love for this piece and a lot of respect for it and a lot of respect for the story and the narratives that we're trying to tell. And it just, it, it blows me away to watch it and to see everyone put their hearts so vulnerably into it. And it makes me feel very like trusted as a creator and as a director that I'm telling stories that are important and need to be told. They've been really great. And as I, as I was saying before, like having a workshop period where we were able to develop that work kind of slowly and do rewrites actively has been just great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have there been any particular discoveries or maybe even fun anecdotes from rehearsal that you felt were yeah. that you like to share? <laughs> well, one anecdote is that every time I do a rewrite, I have to say, and this is why it's so great to have a workshop, to have actors in the room, but every single time and there's a million rewrites. So I will say it every three minutes. So the cast obviously loves and doesn't get annoyed with me at all. Oh, One of the most greatest experiences was, so as I was saying, this developed as an audio drama. And as much as I tried to get away from it and try to explore what it's not in this version of it, I, it still will always be linked back to its roots of being an audio drama in the text somehow of telling and not showing because, you know, like only words could do the work at that point. But we had a movement workshop and an intimacy workshop this week where we explored the kind of dynamics between each pairing of characters and also explored uh, the relationship of like sexuality in this piece because it's a lot about pleasure seeking and danger, especially in, in this time period and in what the club is and what David's represents. It's about sort of this this pleasure to danger circle, if you will, and how those connect. And I've never been able to see that without the text and to just do it through movement and to be so removed from the text and to have actors perform this and for me to watch it, it was so moving in another way. I couldn't have even expected it with this piece. I was like, wow, this just unlocked so many new, new things coming into the real world and physical space. So that was incredible. And now I'm like, well, now I want to write another draft. So, but we can't, we can't, we can't. I'm frozen, I'm frozen. Uh, you <laughs> can just do a sorry cast. sorry cast. Sorry, <laughs> cast. One more, just one last one. Just one more. <laughs> They're not annoyed at all. <laughs> No, that's great. No, it's, it's, it's so cool to hear that you have movement integrated this as well. I think the idea yeah. of doing it in concert sounds very conducive to something that was already in audio form, this yeah. tell don't show mentality that you already said. So yeah. now the fact that you have the benefit of physical bodies, the stage, and you can actually implement those visual elements sounds great. Yeah. And also like, additionally, like with all my designers on board on this team who are all top, top tier student designers and colleagues to also have them on the project now and to be seeing costume designs and lighting designs and production designs and what all that is also into the space. Uh, and that's the piece is quite astounding. It's, it's quite honestly a dream come true. Oh, that's it's really cool. Yeah. So you've already alluded to this, but I was going to ask you, are there any plans for the show after this showcase is completed? So you've mentioned Heart House has expressed interest in keeping the pulse alive. Has anyone else been contacting you or is that really just stick with Heart House for the time being and see how that development Unfurls. Yeah, for sure. I think I would love, I mean, I'd love to see what occurs after this process and who is interested after seeing it in, the, in this form. I'd love to submit it places. You might see people pitch it. I mean, this is like the first musical that I feel like I feel very comfortable 
first piece of writing of mine that I feel comfortable enough kind of going out with and feeling very confident and strong in. So I'm excited to see where it goes and, and hopefully have it produced soon in another capacity. Well, yes, I'm sure this will not be the end of it. That <laughs> it'll have an extensive afterlife. And yeah, you seem to have your hands in enough pies around the city and elsewhere. <laughs> and you can probably, you know, convince a lot of people to come check it out. And I'm sure yeah, more yeah. interest will be sparked in that way. And yeah, on that note, aside from The Grey, what other projects do you personally, do you know anything you have coming up on the horizon that you'd like to share or are able to talk about right now? Yeah, I'm in a Fringe show this summer at the Toronto Fringe called Retrograde. I'm going to be acting. Very exciting. Haven't acted in a while, a couple of months. <laughs> That'll be fun. And graduating. Those are the two main things on the, on the docket. And resting after this. Yes. Rejuvenating. Much, much needed, <laughs> well-earned rest. <laughs> that's good. Oh, well, that's exciting about your Fringe show. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. You know, last year uh, here on The Cup, we inaugurated a Fringe Roundup format where we saw as many shows Ooh. as we could and then reviewed them all after the festival ended when we find a breather. <laughs> so yeah, we yeah. can make a point of checking that out when we do our Roundup. I'm sure that'll Please be exciting. Do. You know, because you are also an actor, I'm curious, do you have any intention of ever acting in the gray or you would rather just keep yourself Ooh. on the outside looking in? Great question. You know, I can, I've can. i considered it. I think for this version, I was very keen on not. <laughs> I was like, I need to see this kind of like from an, a really, for the thesis betterment, from an objective point of view where I don't have any personal connection to the material. No but, personal you know, connection whatsoever. <laughs> no personal connection <laughs> to one character's sort of like mentality or material that I would like to perform. Um, so I really want to see it from just be a full outside observer, but I would definitely be interested in being in it. I mean, I feel obviously a connection to it, but hopefully we'll see where it takes us. Is there any character in particular you would claim if you were given the choice Ooh. to be whoever you wanted? I mean, not to be the not to be the star, but I feel like I could be an interesting Dorian. You could let yourself be <laughs> the star. Yeah, I could, yeah. Why not? Why it's not? your choice. It's your that? show. Hey. Everyone else just does your bidding. It's fine. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's well, hopefully <laughs> as it continues to develop and has more of an extensive future, you know, maybe it won't be the next one or even the one after that. But once it's, you know, raking up Tony's On down Broadway. the line, then yeah, yeah. you could just be like, I think I want to be in it this time around. <laughs> when it's at the Lyceum Theater. Yeah, for yes. sure. For sure. <laughs> maybe it'll just be a super swing and you could be prepared to come into any role oh. as they need. <laughs> That would be exciting. That would That's be. kind of what I am in this project right now. <laughs> if anybody happens to get COVID or fall ill in another way, you're stepping up. Oh, I'm in. The show must go on. Not done with, because I'm in. <laughs> okay. Well, that's wonderful. So, yeah, The Grey, A Wild Musical in Concert, is opening at Hart House Theatre April 20th and running into the 22nd. Uh, get your tickets quickly, because that's tomorrow if you're watching this when it comes out. And it's a very limited run. And we hope we'll have plenty of opportunities to see it down the line, but make sure you catch this one while it is in concert. Is there a, a ticket link that we could plug? Does the show have its own social media that we could put in the description of this episode for people to check out? Yeah, there is a ticket link on the Hard House page, okay, so we'll um, which is great. There. We'll also put the audio version. We'll put the link to that down there if people want to check that out too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And does the show have its own social handles or not quite? If that's something not that its own social handles, Heart House has a lot of there's a lot of promo for it. So just okay. check out the Heart House Instagram and Twitter. They're always posting about it. Perfect. And what about you? We'll give you an opportunity before we sign off to plug your own personal social media handles. If anyone wants Ooh, to yes. follow you, if you want people, strangers from the internet following you, strangers okay follow me. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. My Instagram is infix with an X. Me, Palermo. And if you want to check out my website, it's www.anthony-palermo.com. Oh, wonderful. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about the show. I'm looking forward to watching it, and I hope others are too, if this has generated excitement for it. Yeah. You can follow us at Cup of Hemlock Theater or at COH Theater on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If anybody's still on Twitter, I don't know. <laughs> if, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, share, subscribe. If you're listening to this as a podcast, you unfortunately didn't get to see what our mugs look like, but do all the podcast oh, things. Well. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, everyone. Check out The Gray, and we look forward to hearing from you all very soon in our next episode. Cheers. Cheers.